Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton and it's time for part 2 of chapter 12 of Bayonetta. So jumping right back where we left off, it's time to do something incredibly stupid and dive outside of a moving aircraft at 3 or 4 miles up in the sky. Um, so we jump straight into this fight which is one of these remarkably boring fights where it's just a whole bunch of random uh, deers and decorations. So there's not really any point trying to get combos on them, you just shoot them until they're gone. Now, this might seem unwise if you've ever seen any kind of um, actual plane system, but we are going to go jump in a wind turbine. In fact, what this structure is for, I have no real idea, because uh, it's definitely not for propulsion, and it's also definitely not... Um... Come on, guys, give me something good. So... It's low-key frustrating, but we have to wait for them to make some nice attacks for us to dodge to get past these fans. Uh, as you can see, right at the back there is a Alfheim portal, which I am heading towards. Which means, yeah, we got a... Uh, <laughs> you can destroy these, from, but only from this side. You can only attack them from behind, so you have to get past by uh, dodging and running through in which time. You can't dodge through them because they knock you back and there's no iframes window when you dodge them. like. Uh, you just immediately take the damage and that's it. Which is frustrating, as you might imagine. So, um, you really are at the mercy of them to just give you attacks you can dodge so you can get through. You can't dodge through them using your dodge iframes, you can't trigger witch time off of anything else, as far as I can tell. So you really do just... yeah. However, it's easier to fight these guys at the back, so it's all for the good in the end. And then, um... On the way out, we can just smash the fans from this side. Um, there's got to be some kind of a joke about smashing fans, but I can't think of it. So, yeah, um, if you don't, remember to keep them alive and uh, get your way through to the back here first. What will essentially happen is... Oops. Oh, that guy was clipped inside. I didn't see him. What will happen is that uh, you have to restart from a checkpoint if you want to actually do this combat challenge, which is frustrating since it's, you know, actually worth... Uh... Well, no, I guess it's not true. I was going to say it would be worth two fights because the, the these guys and the Alpine portal, but if you kill all of these guys uh, before you reach the portal, then you still have uh, done one of those fights. But anyway... If you kill them all before you get through the fans, it's, it's, it's impossible to get to this Alphine portal without restarting. So, yeah, uh, they make a good job of hiding them in this chapter, I've got to say that. So, the other time we fought Golem was not the last time, and neither will this be the last time. There is at least one more Golem in the game to fight. Um, this one's pretty easy, but it can be very dependent on RNG. Basically, whatever the AI decides to do will dictate what you do. Uh, if it chooses to do this uh, punching attack or any of the other attacks where it turns into hands, it's pretty a really easy fight because it's easy to dodge and uh, leaves itself open for a really long time. However, the dragon head is a lot harder to both uh, dodge time right, it's a lot easier to dodge too early, avoid the hit but not get the witch time, um, and also it's harder to get into position to hit the orb which means that you lose a lot of strikes. And um, he doesn't display it at all here, but he can also turn into a bird, and if he does that, you basically won't get any hits in at all. One of the times I've done this, he turned into a bird three, four times in a row, and it was ages before I could even hit the orb at all. So, yeah, not a difficult one, but it can be harder with, if you have bad luck. I'll take a perfect platinum. I will definitely take a perfect platinum. So, <clears throat> I wonder... Uh, I wonder if there's a little bit of self-aggrandization in the idea of naming your game studio Platinum uh, and then having Platinum trophies be the highest. I mean, I know it just reflects uh, the old traditional grading system of bronze, silver, gold, and then of course Platinum and Diamond, I think, they brought in for LPs and stuff. I don't know. There's a conception of stuff here. So I'm actually going to edit until I get out because these fans have... It's the motor that you have to hit and they have really tiny hitboxes and it can take a while to actually smash them. So I'll see you in a second. So yeah, uh, I'm not really sure what this is supposed to serve structurally on this aeroplane, but then there's a lot of questions I have. What are these prongs on the front for? What's this big ring for? I assume that this has some kind of mystical magical purpose. Self, Whoops, triggered this a bit early. So 
glum. Something troubling you? Only your constant fretting over my state of affairs. I've no time to play games with you. No need to take out your stress on me, Bayonetta. It's clear you're worried for the girl. How dare you suggest I care about another human being. Anyway, it's time for the next wizard battle, and I fucking love these cutscenes. They are the best ones in the game. In this, this game was just entirely Jean and Bayonetta having wizard battle. I would still love it as much as I do. Especially here when they're both at their full powers. These kind of like leaping and transformations and everything. It's so rad. Why is there an old-timey sail on the top of this plane, anyway? I assume it's a radio mast, but it looks ridiculous. So, uh, in this fight, I am actually going to record afterwards, because I need to focus. Tell me where she is. Now. My. Aren't we attached to our precious little one? Do you like it when she calls you mummy? You're absolutely delusional. If I leave her, he'll never shut up about it. And his whining is twice as irritating as anything the child could muster. <laughs> You've quite the tongue when it comes to curling round the truth. And what about you? What are you hiding? Why is everything these two say so homoerotically charged? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think these might mean something to you. I have no need for worthless junk. <sighs> Rude. I am well aware of my task, but you have forgotten that I do not need your help. <laughs> That guy is the next boss we'll be fighting, and he's my favourite boss design in the game, but he gets absolutely disrespected here. Zero respect for dragons. It seems your little friend is gone forever. This is the most singularly wizardly thing she does, actually. Freeze time, grab the ice, make a spear. She's basically casting ice bolt. It's actually really cool. with hatred. Accept your violent fate. Accept it and earn the left eye. Prove you deserve it. When I said I'd post-record fight dialogue, this is the fight I was talking about. Ready, and... Fight! They're even lined up like a fighting game intro, intro uh, scene. Ah! So it's very in character for me to have been talking uh, while my opponent dives forward and starts fighting me. Very unsporting of them, but then, you know, Jean doesn't know that I'm recording a Let's Play. This is actually, it's not a difficult fight to get past, but it is a difficult fight to get past well. I did, I I found it really inconsistent. Um, some of the times I've done this fight, I have like breezed through it and barely been hit at all. Um, I think I got platinum on it at one point. <laughs> also, accidental roller skate, always very funny. Um, but for the most part, it seems to be really, really variable, and I'm not sure what dictates the difference. It might just be my mood. Um, you know, sometimes I'm better at this game than others, uh, sometimes I'm on, sometimes I'm not on. And interestingly, that seems to correspond to my capacity as a, as a performer as well, which is interesting, uh, but not really relevant to this fight. She has pretty much the same moveset as she's had in every other fight we have with her, except with the notable addition of a motorcycle, which will show up in a minute. Um, because this isn't just rad wizard battle, this is rad motorcycle jet top wizard battle. Um, I think we can crash into the ocean in a minute. It's pretty cool. 
but yeah, here I use a healing item because I was about to die and I really didn't want to, um, you know, have to start over. But uh, yeah, this is not my best performance and it's, that's kind of frustrating because as I said, I've sometimes done really well and sometimes done really poorly on this fight. I'm not sure why my uh, dodge timings were off, but it is what it is. In fact, does she even bring the motorcycle out? It'd be really strange if she didn't. Um, she has a phase in this fight where she summons a motorcycle from hell and drives it around and tries to run it. Oh, here we go. Yeah, motorcycle time. So there's only two uh, attacks she has that you can actually get witch time off of. Or um, well, there's two kinds of attacks. Her attacks with the motorcycle let you um, give you an opportunity to get uh, witch time off of the dodge timing. And additionally, um, when she does the large single Madam Butterfly attacks with the uh, the Wicked Weaves, that is when you can score some witch time on yourself, right? Still, um, I do think it's interesting. I can't remember if I spoke about this another time, but like I have basically several different personalities in my day-to-day -day life, and they depend entirely on my mood. I, I'm quite different as a person, depending on how I'm feeling. And that bleeds through into this. Um, a lot of my a lot of my recordings are very different to one another in kind of tone and to some extent quality. Maybe they look consistent to you. They look very different from me to me, but you know that's always the way, as I understand it. So yeah, uh, not my best score, but I'll take it. I also love the flailing petals every time either of them gets hit. Teresa. Not yet. She isn't ready. So I was meaning to talk about Ceres's pocket watch, actually. I don't have a ton to say, only that, um... You might assume that this is another of the game's weird anachronisms, because, like... Bayonetta's from around 1500, what the fuck is she doing with a pocket watch? But it's, uh, it may surprise you to learn, as it did me, that pocket watches have actually been around since the mid-1400s. And, um, essentially, uh, they were f extremely rare special showpieces at that time, but uh, by the early 1500s, they were relatively common amongst, you know, the fabulously wealthy. Um, well, I mean, just the upper classes in general. And by the mid-1500s, they were actually fairly commonplace among amongst people who could afford them. The Eyes of the World. Several hundred years ago, the now-vanished clans of the Umbra Witches and the Lumen Sages stood as overseers of time immemorial, thriving from their remote European base known as Vigrid. However, their reign quickly came to a close via a... an close? There's a lot of weird spelling errors in these. However, their reign quickly came to an close via a violent war that ended in their mutual destruction. Their war, lasting for a hundred years... I... That doesn't sound like a quick close. Um saw the witches and their campaign of assassination push them to the brink of victory, yet the people's fear of these powerful women spawned the witch hunts, and eventually both clans vanished into the ether. Long serving the powers that be, it is said the clans did not use their power to interfere with history, but rather to protect its passage. We are told they carried out these duties via the use of their treasured eyes of the world. Yet what this statement means is anyone's guess. What is clear is that the clan's very existence was closely linked to historical change, so much so that even kings and emperors feared the clan's power. There were two eyes of the world, one each controlled by the witches and the sages, which when used together were able to carry out the stated task of overseeing. To prevent the power of these eyes from being used for nefarious purposes, they were equally split and the clans prohibited interrelations in an effort to maintain the balance of power between them. The irony is that the grand war that led to the clan's destruction was sparked by these very treasures. After their downfall, the eyes of the world suddenly disappeared. Information about them is extremely limited. What sort of item were the eyes? What shape did they take? All this remains unknown. The black markets recently saw a large gemstone come onto the market bearing the name Eyes of the World, although it may be a different item under the same name, or even a mafia scam meant to gauge market reaction. There is no proof that the ancient treasure was actually a gem, but there is reliable, albeit troubling, information regarding the treasure and the CEO of the Ithavol group. It is said that he is in search for some unknown item for his development project in next-gen energy, but whether it has any relation to this matter requires further research. So yeah, um, the plot's finally starting to all come together, and hopefully, at some point, 
later in the game, maybe even while I'm fighting the last boss, I will have the time... So, uh, as I was saying, uh, hopefully I will manage to find some, find a moment later in the game to just give an overview of what's actually happening with regards to certain logistics that will become unclear later. Because um, it makes sense, sort of, once you figure it all out, but what I thought intuitively what was happening in the plot um, turns out to have not been the case, and it's actually weirder if you, if you look up the... Uh, is that guy stuck? Oh no, it's just half of him. Okay. It's actually weirder if you look up the um, <laughs> the director's commentary on what is and isn't like actually happening. So, this is the first time when we actually get to... This is a unique mechanic. I don't think it's used anywhere else. Picking her up and moving her around under these protective orbs. But um, it's a nice little uh, modification to the combat. You know, you've got to keep it fresh. You've got to change things up from time to time. So, yeah. Can I get close enough to grab that without getting in the water? Yep. Uh, that's fantastic. So you find yourself, um, you know, trying to find convenient corners or pipes to hide her behind so that she doesn't get hit. As far as I know, it, her being damaged doesn't affect your uh, score at the end of this particular verse, but, you know, it's still just good practice. Actually, yeah, no, I suppose it's not that she's in the bubble, it's that you're going out of your body and putting your body over her to protect her. Which is incredibly heroic if you think about it. But yeah, I uh, I would genuinely just straight up enjoy a... Um, like a full animated movie that was just ridiculous wizard battle. You know, animated with that kind of exuberance, but with more of a... Uh, what would you call it? A um, traditionally wizardly component. So, uh, oh no, wrong wall. Okay. Conveniently, once again, the moon comes out exactly when we need it, which I guess is apparently just something you can say about the moon. The moon is always there for you. Your good friend, the moon. These things are as infuriating to fight as always, but. Uh, this time you have to do it while also periodically going underwater, which is not the world's most favourite place to be when you're fighting. Bayonetta still doesn't seem to have any kind of um, problem with being underwater, but uh, it can be irritating. Also, the frame rate can chug a bit here because there's so many particle effects going on, because you've got like air particles and you've got water falling down because we're sinking. But that's nothing that a little chainsawing can't fix. Why even hit her? She's way over there. So yeah, these guys still have their horrible machine gun attacks that are just infuriating. So, as long as you're in the water, you take persistent damage, I think. So, can I just grab her and go? Can I just get out of here? Can I just ollie outie? Is that the bottom? Fuck, okay. So I think you're supposed to basically keep picking her up and moving her along as the fight goes so that this doesn't happen. But um, yeah, it would have been smarter if I just run straight up to the top at the start and left her here and then fought these guys. I lost a lot of hit points there, that's going to cost me. I mean, fortunately, better to lose hit points than have to start over, but um, still far from ideal. Something else I've noticed about myself as I've been playing through these uh, sections. Actually, is this the end of the chapter? If it is, I won't go rambling about myself right now. Goodbye, Moon. And yep, that is in fact the end of the chapter. Let's see what I, how well I did.
Gold, maybe? Oh, silver? <laughs> that bronze really brought me down. Um, I scored a perfect platinum on that on my practice run, and... Uh, sorry, on that final combat, which bumped me up into platinum for the end, so... Oh well, I'll take it. Something else is that if you repeat a chapter, you actually get the, um... Instead of special drops from certain enemies, you get uh, extra bullets. Which, mean, which meant that when I replayed this chapter for my own funsies the other day, I uh, had about 15, 20 bullets on this section, and it took forever. I think I scored 160. I still missed a punch, because, you know, I'm not very good at this, but... Despite that, anyway. So I guess I might as well talk about the thing right now, which is namely that um, something I've noticed about me in the past couple years is that I have very different personalities based on how I'm feeling. Based on my moods, I'm basically a different person from time to time, so... Um, and what I've discovered while doing this particular project is that that bleeds over into my performing style. So there are a few different modes with which I perform, and there are definitely some that I prefer over others, uh, some I think are more entertaining to watch than others. But um, it's really interesting how much my sort of mood can affect my personality, and then my personality can affect my performance. So that's not really relevant to the game, I just think it's cool. Anyway, join me again next time for fighting a giant dragon, which is pretty cool, I think. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.